On January 26, 1926, John Logie Baird gave the world's first public demonstration of the television. Now television and the NFL go hand in hand as a good old Telly's rise to power coincided with the NFL's rise to become America's favorite sport. In the same year, Hager Clothing Company was founded in Dallas, Texas. Some 52 years later, Hager Clothing would form a partnership relevant to this week's topic, and it all revolves around gold jackets. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is August 11th, 1962, and we're sitting in Canton, Ohio. And I hope you have your hard hats on because we're smack dab in the middle of a construction site. What construction site, you might ask? Well, this is the construction site where we help break ground on what will become a national monument in the eyes of NFL fans everywhere. The Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yes, August 11th, 1962, Canton, Ohio. Breaking ground for the Professional Football Hall of Fame. Here's a side note for you. Did you know that the first hard hat was invented back in 1919? The inventor was a soldier and he based it on the doughboy that he wore when he fought in World War I. Here's what the chairman of the board of Bullard said about his father's invention. The original hard-boiled hat was manufactured out of steam canvas, glue, a leather brim, and black paint. My grandfather built a suspension device into what became the world's first commercially available industrial head protection device. It's crazy to think about how unsafe it was back in the day compared to nowadays. But then again, it was just like that on the gridiron. They didn't even have to wear helmets up until, as we've discussed in previous episodes, in the mid-40s during World War II era. Nonetheless, 1962, there were some improvements. We're sitting here at the construction site, breaking ground. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to hop on the DeLorean to take about a year in the future to September 7th, 1963. This is the opening of the Professional Football Hall of Fame. You and I are here to witness the first 17 dudes being inducted into the Hall of Fame. And it's been going strong ever since. In fact, it's been getting bigger and bigger. And this year will be the 100th season of the NFL. And it's going to kick off at the Hall of Fame game on August 1st between the Denver Broncos and the Atlanta Falcons at 8 p.m. at Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium. But before we get to the 2019 Hall of Fame Enshrinement Weekend, let's go ahead and kick it back a little bit. We got to talk about last year because we had eight total enshrinees. The first come from the contributors category. This was Bobby Bethard. He was a longtime general manager, you know, very highly successful everywhere that he went. Teams ended up in the Super Bowl and all those kinds of things, the playoffs and such. And really, you know, his biggest break was when he was first the director of player personnel in Miami in 1972. That year rings a bell? Yeah, sure. Well, we're talking about the whole undefeated season and everything. He helped with their first two Super Bowls. He moved on to Washington, where he'd help the Redskins during the 80s become a juggernaut powerhouse kind of deal. Then he'd take a little bit of time off and move on over to the beach, where he wanted to kind of chillax on the ocean, and he would head up the San Diego Chargers in the early 90s. Then they would end up going to their first Super Bowl not too long after. There were two seniors, which they used to be called the old-timers, Robert Brazil and Jerry Kramer. Now, Robert Brazil, he had a nickname. That nickname was Dr. Doom because he would just spread doom and death all over the field because he was what they considered Lawrence Taylor before there was an LT. And he did this as a linebacker for the Houston Oilers where he played for Coach Bum Phillips. And even though Bum Phillips wasn't around at the time, his wife, Debbie, said this. Bum always believed that Robert changed the way linebackers played. He strongly believed that Robert deserved to be in the Hall of Fame, and I know he'd be so proud and happy that Robert finally made it. Of course, you probably didn't sound like that, but hey, that's my quote voice. We'll just move on here. Jerry Kramer was our other senior, you know, our third member of the 2018 Hall of Fame. He was a guard for the Green Bay Packers. But he wasn't just 
a guard. He was the guard, considered one of the best of all time, and considered one of the best on one of the best teams of all time, the Lombardi era. And during his tenure, he was able to go ahead and win five championship games, including Super Bowl one and two. So I'd say that's not bad for a career. But the thing that he was most known for was the most famous block in NFL history, just known as simply the block. This came in the ice bowl. You know, that frigid, cold, freezing kind of deal where they had to play against the Dallas Cowboys for the NFL championship to move on to the Super Bowl. This is where he helped spring Bart Starr right through the line to that touchdown, baby. But then, as with every year, there's multiple modern era players as there were five that got inducted last year. There were Randy Moss, Terrell Owens, Brian Dawkins, Brian Erlacher, and Ray Lewis. And whoo-wee, someone like me growing up in that era, those were five dudes that definitely, let's just say you wanted their sports cards, their autographs, you wanted their jerseys, whatever it was. You take them out to dinner, I don't know. But these were some guys. These were some dudes. And that's not to take away from any other players that are being inducted last year, this year, the, the whole contributors, seniors, and things like that. I'm just saying that the time of when I grew up and I was able to watch football, I can actually remember watching these guys play. And the first one, Randy Moss, simply known as Freak. Now, his teammates gave him this because of his just athletically gifted skill set that they had not seen before. I mean, NFL players, we're talking grown NFL players. They would tell people that they mossed somebody which basically meant they climbed the ladder and even this is even practice. You know, we climbed the ladder over the defender and plucked that ball out of the sky. You I get you got mossed, man. Talk about that. Grown NFL players talking about this rookie coming in the league. Now that's some physical greatness that they had not seen before. And at the time of retirement, he was third in receiving yards and second in receiving touchdowns. The next guy we talk about, Tyrell Owens. Now you say the letters T O. And you know defenders are getting about to get scared about in the britches and they don't know what's coming around because they got this guy on the field that he looks like a tight end, the size of him, but the speed and just the way that he's able to just get that ball and just push guys out of the way. I mean, sure, there's some things that are off the field that we don't really need to discuss a whole lot about, but he was still third in receiving touchdowns, second in receiving yards at the time of his retirement. And speaking of those other things, He took an alternative route to get into the Hall of Fame, and that's his own decision. He decided he was not going to be enshrined at the Hall of Fame ceremony with the rest of these gentlemen. He decided he was going to just go ahead and have his own enshrinement at the college where he played ball, and that was his choice. I'm not going to talk about whether I agreed or disagreed with it. I'm just saying that's what he did. Now, the next guy, Brian Dawkins. All-world safety for the Eagles and the Broncos. He was known for his heart and soul, including these crazy hit sacks and turnovers for a decade with the Eagles. In fact, he was given the name Weapon X, just because he was kind of like Wolverine. Just never know what's going to come out. And then the next guy was another defender, Mr. Brian Urlacher. He anchored the middle of the Bears defense, bringing back the monsters of the midway. But the thing that crazy was, he was a safety in college combining his speed and power to create a dominant force. And as a Lions fan, yeah, sure. I didn't feel it was fair sometimes, but neither was the same when it was Randy Moss. So whatever, we'll just carry on. And then the last guy, the last one that actually gave a speech even, was Ray Lewis. And like I said before, he was my favorite non-Detroit Lions player of all time. And they put him last on the pedestal to be able to give a speech as far as up there on stage because they knew he was going to take a while. And sure, he was, um, let's just say, an exceptional and motivational leader, and not to mention a menace on the field. But that brings us to this year's class. This year, we're going to have two contributors, one senior, which it was known as the old-timer category till 1990, and five modern-era inductees. The reason why they have two contributors this year and one senior is because they had that determination where they were going to flip-flop years. One year, two seniors, and one contributor, then the next two contributors and one senior. And that's going to go on for a little bit because 2020 was the last of this uh, agreement that they have here. But let's get into this thing. The two contributors this year are Pat Bolin, who was the late Broncos owner, and Gil Brandt, who was a longtime executive for the Dallas Cowboys. And then he still works for the NFL. 
The senior, or old-timer, is Johnny Robinson. He was a safety for the Dallas Texans and the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, really, that was the same team because, uh, as we found out in previous episodes, the Texans turned into the Chiefs after a little bit of time there in Dallas. Then the five modern category guys we have are the first, Champ Bailey. Cornerback for the Washington Redskins, at least that's where he got drafted, but then he was only in there for a few seasons because he was part of a blockbuster trade, with, which included Clinton Portis, to go to Denver. Tony Gonzalez is the next one, who was a longtime tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs. Then he spent twilight of his career with the Falcons for a little bit. Then after that, we have Ty Law, who was a cornerback for the Patriots, Jets, Chiefs, and Broncos. But he spent the majority, and the biggest impact that he had was with the Patriots. You know, when they were winning those Super Bowls at the beginning of the whole thing with Tom Brady and those big old Patriot guys. Then it was Kevin Mawai who was a center for the Seahawks, Jets, and Titans, but the majority of his impact was with the Jets. Ed Reed rounds out our 2019 class, and he was a safety that spent basically his entire year with the Baltimore Ravens. He did have a year where he split between the Texans and the Jets before retirement, but that was just one of those trying to stay in the league kind of deals. And that begs the question, well, how did these dudes get selected? Funny you ask, because I covered this in a fair amount of depth back in episode 15, which I'll leave a link in the show notes for you. And by the way, you can get to the show notes through your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, I ask that you subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button in your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes each and every week. But let's go ahead and give a recap, you know, just a quick little peek ski as far as how the selection process goes. There are 48 total Hall of Fame voters. That breaks it down into one for each team city, basically a general reporter or someone that covers a team. The 33rd comes from the Professional Football Writers Association. And then there are 15 what they call at-large delegates, meaning that they're just, you know, nationwide, whatever, ESPN, stuff like that. Now, the Professional Writer Association member, they have a two-year term. But the rest of them, they're only taken out if it's by retirement or resignation. You know one of those deals like when you're in the mafia, you're only out by a box. Well, maybe that's not quite the same, but you get the point here. It's just like the Supreme Court justices. As long as they show up and they're a member at the regular meetings, then they get to stay around as long as they want to. So all of these members, though, They meet on Saturday before the Super Bowl. So that Saturday during the day, you know, and that kind of thing. And the lists have already been whittled down throughout the year. This starts like basically as soon as one is over, then they start the next one to get the next year rolling. They vote on the senior, contributor, and modern era categories. But before they get there, the lists, like I said, have already been dwindled down. So they have 18 total players that Saturday before the Super Bowl. There's going to be a total of 15 modern and a combination of three between senior and contributors. So basically, the senior and contributors, those three, it's they're either in or they're not. The 15 modern, now, they're going to have to be voted down again to get to a five vote. So let's just say here, first, they're going to vote on the senior slash contributors. Now, if they get an 80% of yes, then they're in. They don't make that 80%, well, hey, you're not in. Hopefully, you can make it next year. You had a great career. Sorry about your luck, though. The modern era, that's a little bit different because first they have to dwindle the teams. They're going to use a vote here of these 48 delegates. They're going to dwindle the team from 15 down to 10. They're going to take them then from 10 to 5. So you have a remaining of five total candidates. And this is the same as we've discussed as far as the senior and contributors. They take each one of these players. So, you know, the Ed Reeds and the Ty Laws and those kinds of things. So let's just pretend Ed Reeds up. Everybody votes. If they get 80% of the votes for yes, then they're going to be selected that year to the Hall of Fame. If they don't make that 80%, sorry again about your luck. The door's there. Don't let it hit you. But you had a great career kind of thing. And then they proceed to have the same voting process for the remaining four. And as with last year, all five, and it's generally that a lot of times this is going to happen because you're really bringing it down to five total guys, and all five made it. 
So we have our five modern era players, and we're going to have eight total Hall of Fame enshrinees this year. And a Hall of Fame resource made it clear that the enshrinees are inducted as coach, player, or contributor. They're not designated as far as what team they're for, because they're given the considerations as far as the, the player's contribution, not, you know, the team's contribution and all that kind of thing. And that's that's besides the point, but I just saw that it was kind of interesting that they made a designation and a point to say that that's what's going on. So let's look ahead. Hall of Fame weekend is going to kick off here in a few weeks with the Hall of Fame game on Thursday, August 1st at 8 p.m. There's a festival and Hall of Fame autographs and pretty much throughout the day. So I think that if you head out there, you're going to have a pretty good time. On Friday the 2nd, 11.15 in front of the entrance to the hall, they're going to have as many past and all the current Hall of Famers for a photo opportunity. Now you can't get straight away close as, you know, some of the media, but you can go ahead and take pictures from off this little railing that they got there. You know, then you get a chance as the players come around, they walk around, maybe you get a chance to shake a few hands, take a couple pictures, get a couple autographs and that kind of thing. And on that day, they also have the festival all day long. That's going to be open as well as the Hall of Fame. So there's going to be special things going on throughout the day. Then on Saturday, the 3rd, At 8 a.m., the parade will be downtown Canton. The festival, of course, is all day, and so is the Hall of Fame, and they're going to be open. But then the enshrinement ceremony, which is, you know, the big ticket, that starts at 7 p.m. at Tom Benson Stadium. Then, as we get into the 4th, which is Sunday, there's going to be a roundtable lunch at 12.30 p.m., and then the concert for legends at Tom Benson Stadium at 8 p.m., which this year is going to be the Imagine Dragons. And I'll leave links and things like that for you on the website so you can go ahead and plan your trip. Which, again, like I've said before, I highly suggest if you are a fan of football, you love history and anything like that, then I suggest that you go ahead and check this out. It's a very good, family, fun, friendly atmosphere, and I definitely suggest that you take them. But it's going to be a long one, too. So if you have the little ones, little tykes, you might want to bring some snacks. And with that being said, let's take a look at what the hall is all about. From the Hall of Fame site, this is the purpose. The purpose of the hall is to help every fan experience a Hall of Fame life by creating the most inspiring place on earth. The Hall of Fame's creed is this. We protect the game by making it safer. We grow the game by promoting values. We elevate the game by loving those who help build it. The vision reminds us that it's not just about the past, it's the future. It's not just about Canton, it's the world. It's not just a great museum for football. It's a message of excellence everywhere. And finally, the mission is as such. Honor the heroes of the game. Preserve its history. Promote its values and celebrate excellence everywhere. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude podcast and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets regarding last year's in Chinese and the upcoming 2019 Pro Football Hall of Fame class. If you get the opportunity... I suggest you head out to Canton the first weekend of August. Now next week, we're going to hop on the DeLorean for a whirlwind tour to take a brief look at the career of four of this year's in Chinese. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.